Ah, all right, can you hear me? Everyone, uh, how are you doing? I will tell you, uh, I, I apologize for the technical di uh, difficulty, uh, but there is nothing that we can't fix uh, with a little bit of tea, okay? Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, today is going to be a lecture uh, on the uh, topic of hacking and modding of video games, kind of the secret life of games. How do games and their communities change, you know, months, maybe even years after the original developers have moved on? How do games kind of keep living and evolving uh, 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 kind of hand in hand with their communities? And modding and hacking is a big part of that. It's going to be a fun lecture. Uh, I, cannot, uh, I cannot wait to, uh, to show you this stuff. We're going to be doing several live hacks in the next 45 minutes. Uh, and, and, and Ryan, Ryan, if we go longer than 45 minutes, you click that uh, that double speed button on YouTube, okay? You you uh, you uh, we'll we'll speed this up, all right? Um, okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. But before we do that, I really 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 want to thank the GLGX uh, uh, organizers. Uh, so Ryan, uh, Mars, Andrew, everyone who's put so much effort uh, into making sure this is a fantastic event. Uh, beautiful websites, beautiful trailer compilations, uh, uh, getting all of us speakers together. It's super, super awesome. Uh, our, our scene really deserves a great online event and you're giving that to us. Uh, so thank you so, so much. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and begin, but uh, uh, you know, you know, I, you know it's, it's a weekend and I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm not feeling it, okay? Hacking, modding, it's too tough. I wanna go, uh, I wanna go do something else. Uh, hey, here's an idea. Let's all as a group reminisce about some of our favorite games, all right? Uh, and so first, I'd like to reminisce about a game you probably played before, Skyrim, right? Fantastic game, huge open world, uh, and that phenomenal Bethesda polish uh, that we all know and, and, and love and, and expect from them. So let's go ahead and watch the intro of the Elder Scrolls Skyrim and just reminisce about how fantastic uh, it, it is, okay? It'll, it'll take you back, all right? Let's take a look. Ulfric Stormcloak. Some here in Helgen call you a hero, but a hero doesn't use a power like the voice to murder his king and usurp his throne. You started this war, plunged Skyrim into chaos, and now the Empire is going to put you down and restore the peace. What was that? It's nothing. Carry on. Yes, General Tullius. Give them their last rites. As we commend your souls to Aetherius, blessings of the eight divines upon you. For the love of Talos, shut up and let's get this over. Our... As you wish. Come on! I haven't got all morning. My ancestors are smiling at me, Imperials. Can you say the same? You Imperial bastards! Justice! Death to the Stormcloaks! As fearless in death as he was in life. Did you hear that? I said, next prisoner. To the block, prisoner. Nice and easy. What? 
What in oblivion is that? Sentries, what do you see? It's in the fire! Okay, what a what a what a what a classic intro. Uh, though I will be honest with you, I feel like something was a little bit different than I remembered it. Uh, but let's uh, let's keep going here. So Skyrim, awesome, awesome game, awesome intro. But you know what? We're really in the mood for horror right now. Okay, uh, my team just released uh, Greek Tragedy, so we've been playing a lot of horror, and I can't help but uh, think back to the Resident Evil 2 remake. Uh, which was a spectacular, spectacular game not too long ago. Uh, and had had a really, really cool moment in it, in which uh, about the middle of the game, you come face-to-face -face with a stalker enemy that spends a, a big part of the game kind of following you around the map uh, and kind of uh, impeding your ability to solve puzzles, and you have to shake them, and you have to get away. Uh, let's go ahead and reminisce about that particular moment, too. Let's take a look. Jesus Christ! You know, it's it's not really what I remember, but I'm super happy to see Thomas with so many jobs. Uh, after his show ended, uh, he went out, got all these uh, starring video game roles, uh, and, and good for the guy. Good for the guy. All right, uh, let's keep going here. Um, so uh, uh, Resident Evil 2 is cool and all, but you know what? A game that just about everyone played was Mario Kart Wii back in the day. Okay, let's reminisce a little bit about that. Let's take a look. Okay, so it's it's probably about uh, it's probably about time I dropped the act. Okay, uh, so uh, Thomas appearing in all of these games is really unique. Uh, as it turns out, Thomas the Tank Engine has become essentially one of the mascots of the hacking and modding scene. Uh, if you you know a, a very popular new game comes out, one of the first few mods for that game is very very likely to be something that introduces Thomas in in a funny or comedic way. Uh, and what's amazing about this is that it really has given a new life. Whether the owners and authors of Thomas the Tank Engine wanted him to have it, it has given him a new life uh, in a very interesting way and brought him to a new medium and uh, into the consciousness uh, of a bunch of new fans. Okay, um, So 
Uh, let's let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Austin Yarger. I'm a lecturer at the University of Michigan uh, and president of Arbor Interactive, uh, which uh, I believe has two games uh, at the GLGX Expo uh, that you are you're watching now. Okay. Uh, in the past, I've worked on the Sims franchise. I worked at Electronic Arts and did some of their mobile technology. Uh, I worked at Facebook for a little bit. Uh, I now work. Uh, and actually got my degrees from the University of Michigan, their computer science department. I run their uh, kind of primary production course. Uh, I wrote some simulations for DARPA, Girl Scout coders. I worked for uh, uh, Wayne State University, built them some cool stuff. Uh, and I currently run IGA Ann Arbor with Corbin Reeves uh, out of EMU. Uh, and a reminder, I, I am also running uh, uh, the Arbor Interactive. Okay. So today uh, in this talk, the 45 minute version, I want to go over the history of hacking and modding with you and cheat codes and, and what were they? Where did they come from? Uh, why were they valuable? Uh, I want to show you some live hacks uh, and demonstrations, uh, the kind in which you know you can go take your favorite game that you have on, on PC right now uh, and go you know find out what are the numbers that power it? How can you manipulate those numbers, experiment with them uh, to kind of discover how your game works? Create your own cheat codes, uh, create your own little tiny content and mods and stuff like that, okay? And then I wanna talk about the future of modding. Uh, a lot of technological advancements are happening in gaming these days. Uh, you have streaming uh, and you have other technologies that are kind of progressively reducing the amount of control that players have over the games that they buy. And so how do we make sure that modding is still possible uh, in the future for them? Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and get into it. Okay, so it is 1986. And some really, really famous games have recently come out. The Legend of Zelda, Mario Bros, Metroid, they've come out for the NES in North America. And compared to the Atari 2600 games that everyone was used to at the time, oh gosh, these were just revolutionary, right? They were extremely, extremely deep. They looked great. They moved fast. Uh, and their designs were of the quality that we still study today. Um, and uh, also... These games were absolutely brutally hard uh, to beat. Uh, they were extremely, extremely challenging. And you want to ask yourself why. It's very, very interesting. Do you think the designers just wanted to provide their players a super stiff and satisfying challenge? Or was there maybe a little bit of a production slash business um, reason for this? So I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with a blockbuster, okay? So in North America, uh, Blockbuster and other rental chains were essentially given free legal reign to purchase one copy of a developer's product and then rent it out to as many people as they could. And as a game developer, when someone buys one copy from you and then rents out that copy a thousand times, do you get one sale out of that or 1,000? And yeah, developers only got one sale. That was a really, really bad uh, piece of news if you wanted to make enough return so that you could keep making games, pay your employees, uh, and so you had to find a way around that. Well, as it turns out, if you could make your game last long enough for a player, you could change the economics of whether they decide to buy your game or rental, uh, rent your game. And so, uh, let's make our game super long. Well, we couldn't really do that. We couldn't fill our games with tons of content because the tools of this era were not super productive. The cartridges of this era, uh, storage capacity was not super great. And so how do we make our games long without having our games have a ton of content? We make that content super, super difficult to reach, okay? And that's what a lot of developers did. So 1987 comes along and a classic Konami title, Contra, right? Uh, it hits store shelves, and it is a smash hit. It is one of the first uh, kind of run-and-gun, super intense uh, platforming games, uh, and people absolutely loved it, but wow, was it hard, okay? It was extremely, uh, notoriously hard. Um, what players discovered, though, was that if you input a certain sequence of inputs on the title screen, you could start the game with 30 lives instead of three. Okay, and that was a big deal. That made the game a lot more tractable to a lot more players and allowed them to have a much better time as a result for many of them. Now, uh, this code would be discovered in other Konami games uh, and uh, it would thus become known as the Konami code. We'll talk about what the exact code was in just a sec. Uh, but how did this code come to be? Well, 
when you are making software, you got to test it, right? But if you're making extremely difficult software, right, your Q&A team, they're people too. Uh, they need to be able to play through it. And so they might ask you for certain cheat codes. Okay, the Q&A team needs to be given more life so they can actually play through the entire game without some of their skills getting in the way. Um, and they, they had phenomenal skills, I'll bet. But I mean, these games were just that hard. Even if you play these games a hundred times, there was a good chance you might not make it. Um, and so, unfortunately, if you build a piece of software, you build in a cheat code like this, there's always the chance that you forget to take it out for the final release. Uh, and so um, this was the case in some of these Konami releases. They got into the hands of players, but as it turns out, players loved them. And so many other games uh, started leaving their cheat codes in on purpose, okay? Uh, the AVGN had a really, really cool talk uh, on this topic and what it was like uh, to be playing these brutally hard games uh, during this era and to find cheat codes like this. This era, the uh, the late 80s, was kind of before my time. My first console was Crash Bandicoot, uh, sorry, game was Crash Bandicoot in I think like 1999 or something. Um, so let's go ahead and watch uh, for those of us who, who didn't grow up playing these kinds of brutally difficult games. To beat a game back then was kind of a big deal at the time. You know, uh, you didn't always beat every game you owned, and some of you were more skilled at than others. And I never considered myself that skilled in general. Um, I always felt like the other kids were usually better at things than me. Like, you know, I was never good at sports or anything like that. I always had a really low self-esteem. But I realized something that whenever, uh, Kids would come over and they'd play Contra with me. You know, they'd come over like, hey, you want to play some Nintendo? Yeah, what game? How about Contra? Yeah, let's play Contra. And you start it up, I hit the start button, and then they'd be like, wait, 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 wait. Hit the reset, and then I'm like, what? And they say, you forgot to put in the code. I'm like, oh, the code? Oh, there's a way to cheat with this game, huh? Okay. So, the Konami code would go on to be extremely popular, not only among gamers, but in popular culture as time went on. Uh, this is a scene from Wreck-It Ralph in which uh, the uh, main antagonist, spoiler of the movie, uh, uses the Konami code to get inside of the game world he lives in uh, and uh, essentially mess with the player character, the main character. So, uh, what is it? Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B-A, start. That's the code. Um, later on, uh, Google Stadia, in order to prove uh, that they were truly a gaming company, uh, would, uh, during their presentation, put the Konami code onto the back of their controller, uh, only to remove it for the actual launch later, uh, before eventually closing all their studios and, and doing what Google tends to do. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, though, about a year ago today, the creator, uh, Kazuhisa Hashimoto, uh, of the Konami code, uh, he passed away, uh, so it's it's uh, very sad. Uh, but he had a, a lot of impact on a, a a really cool part of video game culture. So rest in peace. Um, in 1987, players would start to discover codes in non Konami games. Uh, they would uh, discover that not only are there codes for for cheating, right, and getting infinite lives or health or something, but some codes would actually give you new content uh, uh, that you couldn't really get otherwise. Um, so an example here was, and I imagine a lot of people accidentally discovered this, was that uh, in the original Zelda game for the NES, if you typed in your name and the name registration screen as Zelda, you wouldn't start the normal game. You would go immediately to the second playthrough of the game, which was the, I believe, called the Master Quest, uh, and it was a much, much, much harder uh, so I imagine a lot of people got themselves into trouble that way. Uh, there was the famous uh, Justin Bailey uh, Metroid code that actually gave Samus a new costume. Uh, so in, an interesting new piece of content. In 1988, players would rush to start purchasing uh, game code magazines. Uh, magazines that were dedicated uh, to providing tips and tricks, right? And they would come with uh, like lists of cheat codes in the back. I remember reading through these when I was young uh, and just kind of marveling at, um, at uh, all the different things you could do. Uh, even for games I didn't own. I was very interested to see what all the codes were for each game. There was a problem, though. 
in that if the developers didn't program a code for a game and leave it in, then you didn't have any codes. And players really wanted to be able to beat a super hard game that didn't have any codes. You get a new costume or a new power-up, right? Infinite jumping in the air or something. And so the problem was not all games had codes. Well, in 1990, a company uh, that you might have heard of before released a product called the Game Genie, okay? And here's what it was. Uh, gosh, I always think it looks like underwear or something. It's really kind of strange, but it did work. Uh, uh, this was actually created by Codemasters in the UK, uh, and they are still around. In fact, Electronic Arts just purchased them, uh, I think, a few weeks ago. Um, and so uh, Codemasters... Uh, there's some technical notes I've listed on the bottom here. You can go to the slides if you want to, uh, and um, uh, that kind of go over how this works in depth. Uh, but uh, the insertion process was essentially like this, and this is a GIF taken from Classic Gamer '88. Um, what you'd do is you'd put the uh, you'd put the Game Genie on. You kind of strap it onto the cartridge, and then you would insert the Game Genie in first. Okay, yeah, it would go in first into the console and then your actual game pack uh, would be sticking outside of it. All right. Now, the question of how did it work is a really, really interesting one. Okay, let's say that you are having a friendly exchange with a friend of yours, right, on the phone. So we got your phone here and, you know, one day, okay, one day someone contacts you. Someone sends you a text message. And it just says unknown at the top, okay? You have a friend named Alice, but one day you get a message on your phone that's from someone called unknown. Now it says, hey friends, it's Alice. I just got a new phone number. And that happens sometimes. Someone gets a new phone number, you have to re-register them, and then they don't appear as unknown anymore. Okay, so you register them on that number and you're good. This is Alice, right? Over the next few months, your relationship grows. You start to share some personal stuff, right? Um, stuff that you really would want uh, leaking out. It's, it's just very, very personal and private. Um, so what's currently happening right now, at least what you think is happening as you converse with Alice back and forth, is that maybe there's you, and maybe over here there's Alice, and you are exchanging what you believe to be an encrypted line. And in fact, it is encrypted, okay? However, in reality, what is happening is that you have an encrypted connection with someone, and Alice has an encrypted connection with someone. But unfortunately, there's someone in the middle. There's a man in the middle. It's Corbin Reeves of Azure Ravens Entertainment. And now he knows what your favorite anime is. And that's really, really bad news for you. Understand, you don't know that Corbin is the man in the middle. Uh, because you pass a message to Corbin, who you've registered as Alice, uh, Corbin then forwards your message to uh, actual Alice. Alice then replies, but replies to Corbin. Corbin sends the reply to you. So it looks like a continuous connection. It looks from what you can see like the above, when in reality it is the below. Uh, and now Corbin knows what your favorite anime is, and that's really bad news. Okay? Um, this is called a man-in-the-middle attack. It is a huge and very important attack in uh, computer security. Uh, and is very, very well studied, and it is actually everywhere once you start looking. If you have ever run into this kind of warning screen when you're going to a certain website in your internet browser, what this is often doing is it's essentially saying, hey, I can't verify that this isn't a man-in-the-middle attack right now. I don't know if it is, but I'm not, I'm not sure that it isn't, okay? This is trying to protect you from a man-in-the-middle attack so that someone in the middle doesn't record the data you're sending through, like a password. Um, these man-in-the-middle attacks are a big deal. Uh, you often see headlines, okay? 500 million users exposed, uh, their data exposed because of an, a, a man-in-the-middle attack vulnerability in the UC browser. Um, however, here, in the, in the case of the game genie and how it actually made its cheat codes work, is we have a genie in the middle attack, okay? Here's the deal. I showed you that the genie is what goes in first. Okay, and the pack is actually hanging out of the console. This is really, really, really important because what we have here is we have communication between the NES hardware, the console, and your actual authentic game pack. All that has to go through the game genie. Okay, you cannot talk. The, the game pack can't talk to the console without first sending that information through the game genie. 
And that is a very, very powerful position to be in. The genie in the middle controls all communications. It can intercept communications. It can forward it through just like normal. Uh, it can change it and then send it through, right? Uh, and that's a very, very powerful position to be in. So here's what happens, okay? You've got your NES hardware. Your NES, when the game boots up, might ask some questions to the game pack, okay? Uh, you've got your game gene in the middle, and then you've got your game pack. When the game starts, uh, the console, if it's playing Super Mario, might say, hey, game pack, where should Mario begin the game? And, you know, that request goes through the Game Genie. The Game Genie just forwards it to the Game Pack. The Game Pack says X equals 30, Y equals 15. That uh, response goes back through the Game Genie, un unaltered, and gets back to the console. Good. It's working exactly like it normally does. It might ask, hey, Game Pack, what kind of sprite should I use for the clouds? And it just goes through the Game Genie, no alterations like normal. The cartridge tells it how to render a cloud. It goes back through. It's all good, right? Hey, Game Pack, how many lives should the player start with? Definitely 1,000 is the only response that comes back to the hardware. You see, uh, the Game Genie sees that this particular request is coming through. It stops, halts that request, changes it. Hey, you don't start with three lives. You start with uh, 1,000. And the hardware, the console, is none the wiser. It doesn't know if a, a particular response is coming from the Game Genie. Uh, or is coming from the game pack itself, okay? <clears throat> and so that's really, 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 really a big deal. The question just never reaches the actual game pack, and the NES hardware is none the wiser. It just runs and continues to work, okay? This man-in-the-middle attack allows for more or less con complete control of the game. And so if you're Codemasters, then you simply program this device to know if I'm playing this game and this request comes through, return this response, okay? And that's how you get your cheat code to work. So the Game Genie was popular, but competition started to appear, uh, and for other consoles as well. Uh, some of you may remember the Game Shark, uh, which was, I think, very popular on Game Boy Color uh, and Game Boy Advance. I had one back in the day. Uh, uh, there was one for the N Nintendo 64, and if you doubted that the uh, Game Pack, the, 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 the cheat device always wants to be in the middle, <clears throat> look at this crazy, crazy stack right here. You've got two Game Sharks, maybe a Game Shark expansion pack, on top of each other, and then at the very top you have uh, your actual Nintendo 64 game. That looks precarious. I'm pretty sure we're going to snap uh, something if, uh, if we're not careful with that stack right there. Um, that's the, uh, the Game Shark, the, uh, uh, well, what is it called, the, uh, the Game Boy Advance version. And then we've got the action replay on the DSi, okay? Uh, I want to state something. None of this information is meant to condone or advocate piracy. You absolutely, absolutely should not do that. Uh, that really, really harms developers who would be able to invest more in making amazing games uh, if only piracy was not a thing, okay? Do not use this knowledge or expertise to do any piracy yourself. Take this knowledge and use it to better understand how modern uh, hardware and electronics works, okay? For your educational purposes only. Uh, do not be a black hat, all right? Okay. On PCs, things were very, very interesting, okay? Because when it comes to modding in the modern day, things are just a bit different. You have your, uh, your uh, computer here, okay? And let's say um, when you load a PC game, right, when you download it, load it from disk, it goes into a place in your computer called RAM, all right? A random access memory. Now, you might have something like Steam, okay? You might have something like Steam, and when you download a game like Resident Evil 2, it goes from Steam's cloud into your computer, where it starts to run. Now, the thing here, the important takeaway, this might seem obvious, but what, what, what we're saying here is maybe not so obvious. You own your RAM. Your RAM really is yours, particularly on PC platforms. You can read it, you can view it, you can manipulate it if you want to. Okay, so this game being in RAM, you can actually go in to your RAM while you're playing a game like RE2, and you can start flipping bits, you can start manipulating stuff, just like uh, the Game Genie did, right? The Game Genie controlled the uh, config and, and how the game was playing, and you can too. The problem here is that if our game is running in RAM, what it's really doing is it's just a bunch of zeros and ones. And it's very, very, very difficult to understand. Assembly code, you know, what part of this block of zero and ones represents my health bar. Yeah, just about anything could, and that's a really big problem. Because we can't start to manipulate this stuff if we don't know where things are, okay? So how on earth do we begin to manipulate this? 
Well, the answer is we want to have really good tools, and they are out there. And we're going to talk about those in just a sec. So the kind of tools that we're going to talk about today that can help us kind of figure out where certain important values are in our RAM, you know, while we're playing games, um, it are tools like a BGB, an emulator tool, uh, and uh, 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 tools like Cheat Engine. Uh, these tools are, are very, very good at allowing you to basically at any time pause a game and search through the entire contents of that game's RAM, okay? Uh, and this will help us a lot. Uh, so we're going to do some demonstrations now, and, and they're both kind of risky. The second one is very risky, um, uh, so hopefully these will work. Uh, uh, otherwise, otherwise, I'll just have to re-record them, and that's fine. Um, uh, but the first game we're going to be uh, playing and demonstrating, and by the way, these tools are available online. Uh, there's the link there if you want to watch the recording. Um, but uh, the first game that we're going to uh, play is a game, uh, Looney Tunes, for the Game Boy Color, okay? Uh, this is a, uh, the Game Boy Color only had two kilobytes of RAM in 1999, so the amount of values it could actually have for us to explore and look through is not that big, okay? Um, the goal is going to be we want to find out where the points and where the lives are stored in RAM, because uh, I got you know I, I got to have the highest score. Otherwise, my my uh, friends are going to make fun of me. Okay, and, and this game is brutally brutally hard. Uh, so we're going to need those extra lives. Now the approach we're going to do is we're going to scan for values that increase after we score points in game or decrease after we lose lives. And that's how we're going to kind of narrow down where we think uh, those values could be stored. Okay, we'll be using the BGB emulator. And do not worry too much. Okay, I've got my copy right here of the game. Uh, so please, please do this on your own copies, okay? Do not go grabbing uh, 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 stuff from online. Um, do this on your own copies, or at least make sure you own the game first, okay? Uh, make sure the developers get their cut. Okay, uh, and then next we're going to do a much harder game. We're going to do Street Fighter IV, much more modern and recent too. So let's go ahead and, uh, and uh, get out of this uh, slideshow here, and we'll, uh, we'll see if we can make it happen. Okay, so uh, we have, let's go ahead and exit here. We have our, let's see here, doo -doo -doo, 494, here we go. Okay, we've got the GBC cheats area. Let's go ahead and run our BGB emulator. Okay, here we are. So we've got the BGB emulator. We'll go ahead and uh, drag the game in. Okay, so now we have uh, the Bugs Bunny Looney Tunes game. Uh, it's called Carrot Crazy. Uh, run it. All right. Gets me pumped up every time, chat. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, and get into it here. We're Bugs Bunny, and we're gonna go run around. We're gonna enter the first stage. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so here we are. Here's a normal gameplay. I'm gonna turn the sound down a little bit. Uh, this is what normal gameplay looks like. We got lives down here. We got uh, numbers, uh, uh, points down here. We want to figure out where in our RAM those points are. So we're gonna grab ourselves a nice carrot. Grabbing carrots is what brings our points up. That's gonna be important. But right now, what we want to do is we want to figure out what what does the entirety of our RAM look like. What are all the ones and zeros and hex values that actually make this game uh, run? So what we can do is we can right click here and most tools of, of this nature will come with a lot of options uh, for essentially dumping our RAM. And here's one of those, uh, what, what BGB calls the cheat searcher, okay? What we'll do is we'll click start. What this has done right here is this has given us uh, a look at every single address location in the game and every single value in those address locations. That's really, really important. So now what we want to do is we want to go change the value of our score and then we want to narrow down and filter our search through all these address spaces we only want to keep the ones that have gone up right so let's go ahead and we'll grab ourselves a carrot look at that 3d carrot that's pretty sweet for the game boy color we grab it our score goes up okay and so now what we'll do is we want to keep values which are above uh the previous value do a search and we've gone from like thousands and thousands of addresses to addresses that can fit within a page. Let's go ahead and do it again. All right, let's do it again. We're gonna go across the water here. Let's go ahead and get ourselves a carrot. There we go, we got a carrot. 
We'll do it again, okay? Only keep the values that have increased. There we go. Now what we want to do is let's go ahead and uh, keep all the values that didn't change, that are equal to the previous value, okay? Um, let's go ahead and grab one more carrot if we can. We might get shot by Yosemite Sam. Okay, now we're gonna keep those that are above, and there we go. We're down to three. Now we're gonna guess, okay? Let's go here uh, to that location in memory, and we can see down here that four right there, that four, uh, I believe that represents the number of carrots we got. So let's go ahead and uh, change this. Uh, let's change all of these and see what happens. I want these to be, uh, oh, like 99, all right? Heck yeah, all right. Um, let's see here. Go in, modify this particular value from 4 to 99, and uh, we'll see what happens. So we played the game, and uh, oh, that's strange. The UI is messing up a little bit. I don't think we went far enough. Let's go and address uh, and adjust this one, too. See what happens. So much of this is, is uh, experimental. you got to play around. Okay, and hey, there we go. There we go. You take this to uh, to your, your uh, elementary school. You show off how you managed to get this many points, and... Students won't, uh, the other, your friends won't believe you, okay? So the pro tip uh, for all the uh, elementary schoolers out there watching this. Okay, so uh, that's cool and all, but this game is so hard, if I can't get through it, what's the point? So I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need some more lives. Okay, let's do the same thing. We're gonna do a scan. We're gonna get all of our address values back in the entire game. Uh, and then we're gonna go and throw bugs in the drink. Oops, okay. <laughs> all right, so let's, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, IRL to any IRL fights. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and uh, keep values which are below the previous value because we lost a life, right? That has gotten us uh, down a little bit. We're going to need to throw bugs into the drink again. I'm sorry for science. <clears throat> okay, as soon as that value goes down to 2, we're going to do another search. Keep values which are below the previous value. We're then going to run around a little bit. Okay, and then we're going to do the, the keep values which are equal to the previous value. And we're going to throw bugs in the drink again. We have to be a little bit careful, though, because we uh, we could fail out here if we, if we throw them in too many times. Okay, so now let's go ahead and, and do it one more time. Oh, that was perfect, wasn't it? So, uh, look here, that's a 1, so I'm pretty confident that represents the one life we've got left. How about uh, 99? Sounds pretty good to me. Out, and there we go. There we go, 99 lives. I'll go ahead and jump in the drink just to prove it. We should go to 98. And then uh, I want to show you one final thing before we jump to the harder game to do. So there we go, we're at 98. Now that's cool and all, but if you really want to want to, um, uh, uh, if you really want to surprise people, um, how about we go grab ourselves, um, oh, I don't know, how about BC lives? Now, BC is actually a valid number because all of these are hex values, okay? Um, uh, which essentially means that you can represent 0 uh, through 16. Um, so, here we go. Uh, Bugs Bunny now has heart hot dog lives. So congratulations. That'll take you far. Okay. So let's see what it becomes when we lose the... We're gonna lose the hot dog. We're now heart heart lives. Alright, there we go. So that is a really easy and simple example of how you can just get into a game and start messing with its data. You can kind of experimentally figure out where certain things are stored. Okay. <sighs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, I'm gonna pause the video just in case I need to record this next part. Okay, cross your fingers because we're doing Street Fighter. Now, Street Fighter 4 uh, isn't that old of a game. It was released in 2009 for PC. Uh, oh gosh, that makes me feel old, I guess. Okay, required minimum uh, amount of RAM was one gigabyte. Uh, and that's a lot of address spaces. Okay, compare that to the Game Boy Color, which had two kilobytes. Uh, that is several orders of magnitude larger. Why? My goodness. How are we going to make it? All right, we're going to use Cheat Engine, which is kind of a more powerful version of the filtering uh, tool we just saw in the BGB emulator. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, cross your fingers, and uh, let's let's see if it happens. Hopefully I don't have to record this too many times. All right, let's go ahead and uh, Street Fighter. Okay, there we are. Let's play the game. 77 hours. I must have left it on overnight or something. Yeah, I do that a lot. It's not good for power, though. It's not very sustainable. Okay. So, we have Street Fighter that's launching. Uh, what I want to do is I want to launch a Cheat Engine. Okay, Cheat Engine, boop, there we go. Okay, Street Fighter, there we go. Got to check for all that DLC. <clears throat> okay, we now have Cheat Engine. Uh, I'll, I'll, t I'll, I'll, uh, I'll show you and explain this um, 
I'll explain this in a little bit, but the first thing we need to do is we need to go ahead and attach to our process. We can see our, our running process here, and we could actually debug and, and make cheat codes for our browsers if we wanted to, our folders, Explorer. So we'll grab the Street Fighter process. Okay, that will give Cheat Engine access to the RAM uh, that is powering Street Fighter right now. And we'll go ahead and what we're going to do is we're going to start the arcade mode and we're going to get into a fight. And what we need to do is exactly what we did with Bugs Bunny. We need to start taking a little bit of damage because what we're going to do is we're going to make our own infinite health cheat code, okay? So we're going to give ourselves infinite health so we can truly be uh, unstoppable, all right? So let's uh, get into it. I feel like I'm lagging a little bit. Am I moving in like slow motion team? It's kind of cool in a way. Let's uh, let's hope it, it looks okay though. Looks like SIM is behind the Okay. All right, so we're gonna need some help from Dalsim. Uh, he's going to need to attack us a little bit and uh, get our health down so we can find out where our health is. All right. Okay, good. So the first thing we do is we pause the game. What we want to do right away is we need to do an initial scan. We need to give Cheat Engine access to all of the RAM uh, and address space, uh, address values uh, that we, we need to search through. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to do a first scan, but we want that first scan to be for values that are smaller than 1500 because I think that most of the Street Fighter player uh, kind of character health maxes are lower than 1500. I'm a, I also think that it's represented by two bytes because that's a little bit more efficient for this. And I experimentally, I just know it happens to be two bytes. Okay, that's you figure this stuff out by just do, trying a bunch of options and doing what you think makes most sense first. Let's do a scan. Oh, I did exact value, didn't I? Okay, let's uh, let's try this again. Let's do a new scan and let's do a smaller than 1500 value. That's two bytes. Okay, think wow, 1500 results. We're, we're already there, you know? Okay, um, oh, no worries, team. We only have, oh, 93 million, 94 million addresses to check. That's going to take you a while. Okay, so let's go ahead and take some damage. Help us out, Dalsim. Just a, a light light hit, please. Don't do anything crazy. Okay, good, good, good. All right, good enough. So we're going to pause the game, and we're now going to scan and keep all values that have decreased, okay? We're just going to keep those. We're going to keep all values that have decreased. We've gone from like 40 million to uh, 200,000. So that's good. That's a good step right there. We only have so much health though, so we do need to be efficient with this. So let's go ahead and do that exact thing again. We're now down to 7,000. That's still way too many to, to guess. Okay, we take another uh, piece of damage. And do another scan. We're down to 750. Eventually, this is going to stop giving us good results here. Oh, come on, come on. Let's go. Hey, all right. So here we are. Uh, let's do another scan. We're now down to 284. Now what I want to do is I want to just keep the value the same. Okay, keep the value the same. Good. I'll let a little bit of time go past. Now we're going to keep all values that are unchanged. Next scan. We're now down to 24. All right. Let's do one more decrease because I, I think I can guess this, but I'm not sure. So let's take a little bit more damage. Okay, good. And now... We're going to do one final decreased value scan. We've got 18 addresses to look through now. Okay, so now what we can do is we can grab some of these addresses and we're just going to experiment with them, okay? How much health does Chun Li have? That's a little bit over halfway to 1,620. So I think, I, I'm feeling pretty good about these. Let's go ahead and I want to change these values. I'm going to change the 620 to 1,000. And what we're going to be wa uh, watching for is we want to see if Chun Li's health goes up. If it does go up, we found our values. If it doesn't, we need to try other ones, okay? And boom, there we go, look at that, we got it. So we know where the health is stored now, and that's really useful, because not only can we manually make health go up, but we can actually go into the code, and we can find out what writes to that particular location, what changes that health value. So we'll go ahead and we'll start that up. <clears throat> and uh, let's go ahead and take more damage. Help us out here. Okay, we took damage. So now, if you look here, we had one particular write to this location, and it's very suspicious. Let's go ahead and look at this place in the code. We can now see the assembly code. We can see that there's a move operation going on here. It might be swapping out our health for a lower value of health. What we can try to do is we can replace this line uh, of assembly code with code that does nothing. Okay, a bunch of no-ops, a bunch of noops. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's go back now, 
and let's see what happens. We, actually, let's do this with the other value too. Find out what writes this address. We'll go ahead and we will take some more damage. Help us out, Dalsine. That's a big hit. Ooh. Oh, interesting. So the UI is not updating anymore. Okay, so now let's go in here. We've got a, uh, a subtract operation. Let's uh, just replace this with code that is nothing. Okay, and then we will go ahead and stop and we will close and we'll play the game. Hopefully, we no longer take any damage. Let's see here, come on. There we go, look at that. Now hits do not do any damage to us anymore. We have successfully, we essentially we've created the, the foundation of a cheat code, okay? We could then put this uh, sequence of steps that we just did into a script, a Python script, and we now have a reliable cheat code that we can use every single time we play this game, okay? So yeah, a pretty darn cool uh, example here. Uh, we can go on to win the tournament uh, in the least honorable way possible. Okay, so uh, that's an example of, uh, of uh, hacking uh, and creating a mod uh, for a more advanced, more modern game. Though I will say this, do not do this kind of thing when it comes to online play. Again, only use these techniques to further your own education and understanding of the uh, modern software and hardware that you use, okay, and that you own. Okay, so we've seen that if you know where certain things are stored in a game's RAM, in their memory, uh, then you can manipulate them. And if you this information is really, really valuable for making things like cheat codes and mods. If you look around, you'll find that uh, many communities exist online that are dedicated to figuring out together, experimentally, where these different values are. So you can speed up the production of cool, unique content, like cheats, like mods. Um, the value of mods, though, is something we haven't quite talked about. Uh, so this really is an era of mods uh, uh, where... If a game comes out and is popular, you can expect there to be some really cool stuff. And some businesses, some monies, uh, sorry, some monies, some game developers um, uh, do consider mods to be a really, really important part of their product strategies. Uh, so uh, companies like Bethesda will make it fairly easy for people to figure out how to mod them, to access the technologies that power the game, to write scripts that adjust the game somehow so that the community can entertain itself and generate more content based on what the developers initially created. All right, so I believe, I believe Bethesda has their own like distribution site for mods, which is kind of interesting. Um, there's some games out there like Gary's Mod that are very literally about, entirely about various people contributing various mods that are interesting and, and unique. Um, uh, there is Nexus Mods, which is a website dedicated to organizing all of this and helping uh, players get the most out of their mods. Um, there are fan games, right, where maybe you don't hack or, 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 or study the underlying code, but you try and replicate it using your own software. Uh, so uh, some mods out there meet uh, needs that customers have that the companies just aren't really interested in meeting right now. Smash Brothers uh, Melee HD has been a, a request from the community for a long time. Um, however, uh, it actually already exists. Uh, the Dolphin emulator is fully capable of taking uh, GameCube visuals and sharpening it up to HD and adding widescreen support and stuff like that. Um, there are mods uh, that have become extremely popular for events such as AGDQ. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to show this, but this is a mod that essentially randomizes the placement and ordering of weapons and key items so that you can always get through the game, but your playthrough is likely to be very unique. You might get a weapon that is far weaker than the one you normally get early on, and that makes your entire playthrough a little bit diffi more difficult. Or the very first like tutorial weapon you could get isn't a stick, it's a rocket launcher, right? And that uh, changes the way you play through the game in a very surprising way. Uh, yeah, here's a gif of it. Uh, but uh, they're doing a race uh, at, at uh, AGDQ, and they're getting different items in different orders, so that's really affecting the race. It's very, very fun. Mods can be used as speedrunning tools. So if you are someone who runs, and I'll, I'll make my face go away so you can see in the corner over here, but if you are someone who runs a game like Resident Evil 3 uh, for um, uh, viewers who want to understand how the game's going, you can write a mod that will output video and display uh, like what is the current HP of your character? You know, how many bullets do you have? How hard is the game adjusting its dynamic difficulty uh, uh, for you? Uh, and so it's really, really useful in that way. It's kind of a tool. Um, oh yes, right in the corner there. 
So a question is, how can we make our games more moddable? How can we allow players in the communities that form around our games, uh, should we be so lucky to get that, uh, uh, how can we empower them more? Um, so approach number one is to simply do nothing. But this isn't a super great approach. It can work. If your game is absolutely prolific and people truly love your game, then they will go in and they will build their own modding infrastructure to make it easier for others to mod the game. They will reverse engineer your game. They will study the zeros and ones until they figure it out. Uh, this is the case with Smash Brothers Melee. Uh, they have an entire community that is uh, very, very invested and uh, enthusiastic about going through and building out uh, the stuff that Nintendo never provided. Um, there are uh, indie titles uh, and other titles that will do something that isn't super hard. Uh, they will simply expose their asset files, the files that power their game. They will make sure that they are easy for the player to get to and look at. So if you download Darkest Dungeon and you go into its uh, config files uh, on your system, you'll find that there are a lot of uh, like human-readable file types. There are images, there are text files, uh, and they tend to look like this. Uh, they are maybe a little bit unusual, uh, but you can read through them and you can see, okay, combat skill for this class. Okay, level zero, type melee, attack is 85%, damage zero, crit 0%, 2%. You can adjust these numbers in here to adjust how each class handles, essentially. Um, and uh, this, these uh, images are from uh, Lucas uh, Blade 2, so please check out uh, his, uh, his research uh, and, uh, and support him, okay? Um, approach number three is a little bit harder to do. It is to expose a scripting language. Um, the Binding of Isaac does this. This is a game that uh, powers a lot of its gameplay through the Lua scripting language, which is really, really neat for a few reasons. So uh, it is an interpreted, non-compiled language. If you have a compiled language like C++, you might have human-readable code over here that is easy to understand and manipulate, but it's nowhere near as easy to, easy to understand and manipulate as uh, Lua code. Um, and also, when you compile C++ code and ship it with your game, it turns into ones and zeros, which is very hard to figure out and understand. Um, Lua is not compiled, it's interpreted, and so it just kind of stays the same. You could very well find these Lua scripts on your desktop, open them up, and go, oh, so that's how that mechanic is actually programmed, okay? Um, the Binding of Isaac also, uh, as a result, has a really, really nice modding community. They have a uh, they have websites, uh, the Binding of Isaac, the Modding of Isaac, which is a super cool website that kind of tracks mods and it helps you understand how to build your own mods. It ranks mods. It's really, really good stuff. It comes with a, uh, a, a reference guide that uh, explains how you can hook into various central systems uh, that the developers provided and uh, so how you can change the gameplay, change the aesthetics, change the AI in that, that way, okay? So scripting in Unity games though, is a little bit interesting because technically C Sharp already is Unity's scripting language. It already has a, a scripting language. However, uh, it's not always that easy to customize at runtime or even get out of the games, uh, the executables. Um, it is possible, I bring up this game right here, which is a, a fairly controversial game, in part because I do know someone. Uh, it is is made in Unity, and I know someone who uh, who managed to find out how the game was programmed. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not it's not super pretty, but hey, whatever works, I guess. Um, whatever they they've got going. Um, so scripting is a thing in Unity, and what you can do is you can layer more scripting languages on top of uh, Unity, C sharp, uh, such as Python. You can use the Iron Python project, uh, which is a fairly easy way to be able to run Python code uh, in your Unity games. Um, or you can you do use you, Lua. So Moonsharp is a really cool project that we use at Arbor Interactive, and it's really really great uh, for uh, for configuring certain characters, uh, pieces of data, statistics that can't just be a number. They need to be a number, but actually that number needs to be a function of the current state of the game. Okay, that's when this tends to be really really valuable, and you can load this stuff. You can literally have these files on your desktop. Use C Sharp to find them, load them up into your game, and then boom, you're running. All right. Um, this is a little bit technical, but what I'll say for those of you who are watching who are really inter interested in, okay, how do I build out this kind of thing, uh, this kind of infrastructure that makes it easy to mod, I recommend that you do a Google search on the PubSub design pattern. Uh, it is a very, very nice way of allowing systems to communicate and send events to one another without having to actually know about each other's existence. And that's really, really powerful. Uh, usually when you want to subscribe to events of a system, 
you need to know about that system being existent, and that makes it hard uh, for uh, for games to allow additional new systems to come in uh, and affect the game. So this uh, pub sub design pattern can be super super useful. Essentially, systems communicate with an event bus, which then sends those events, relays them to everyone who cares about those particular events. As a result, your systems need to know about the event bus, but your systems don't need to know about each other, and that's the important part. So they're not coupled. So let's go ahead and briefly talk about the future. I might be running a little bit long. Um, so mods in the streaming era, right? And I know some of you are probably chuckling to yourself right now. Streaming era, psh, uh, Google's going down, right? Uh, well, they may or may not end up shuttering Stadia like their other projects. But, uh, well, okay, I, I wouldn't bet against it at this point. But here's something to consider, okay? There are a lot of other services coming. Microsoft has xCloud, right? Uh, they are very intent on making sure that you are able to play those AAA games uh, from your phone if you want to. Um, what about uh, uh, Sony? Sony has the exact same plans. They see in their next gen uh, that uh, streaming is going to be a big thing. This is from one of their, I think, investor slideshows. Um, uh, in fact, Sony and Microsoft were so spooked by Stadia and the streaming technology that they actually signed a partnership together which is pretty unprecedented. Even third parties, smaller ones like Capcom, have been trying their streaming technology out uh, uh, to, to make games more accessible, which is really, really cool. Um, I'm gonna skip this. Essentially, one of the ways that we support modding is that, um, oh no, I don't think it has any audio. Um, we have games like this Match 3 here that essentially load their data from a Google spreadsheet online. Um, now, for instance, it gets the icons that it's going to use in the game from that online spreadsheet. Now, what's cool about online spreadsheets is that it's easy enough to find and it's easy enough to make a copy of that spreadsheet. You can then add things to it, like I'm adding a uh, donut into, I'm adding a bagel into the spreadsheet right here, and I'm signing it a value. So there's our, uh, there's our bagel, and I'm going to give it a value of, wow, that's a lot of points, 5,000 points per bagel. Jeez. We then reload the game, it, it uh, takes a look at that uh, new spreadsheet data, and then suddenly we have a match three that uh, has a bunch of bagels in it, which is really cool. Um, with this kind of approach where uh, data is loaded externally from the game, it allows players, even if the, the files aren't on their desktop, it allows players to go online, find the source of the data, make a clone of it, customize it, and then feed that source of data back into your game if you provide the option for it, okay? That's one way you could support modding even if uh, we, 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 even if we're in a streaming future where players don't have these cool files on their local system where they can actually manipulate it and study it, okay? So anyway, uh, I want to watch a couple more awesome mods. Uh, this is one of my favorite, Drift Souls. If you've ever played Dark Souls, this is a big change uh, to that game. Uh, and then I want to finish up with a final word, okay? Yeah, so that is a that is a choice mod if I've ever seen one. Premium cheese right there. So please check it out if you're interested. Okay, so when it comes to the secret life of games, right, you might think that mods are only a video game thing. Hacks are only a video game thing. I want to argue that mods and hacks have been happening to all forms of media for a long time. Everyone knows this painting, and you, there's a good chance that you've seen riffs on it too, online or in various uh, uh, TV shows or in other media, right? It is a way of taking a piece of media, 
uh, or a, a thing in general, right? And expanding its life, giving it new meaning, uh, allowing the user, the consumer, to take a little bit of ownership in that creative process. And a lot of people find that very satisfying and very thrilling and rewarding. Uh, and so we should be very lucky uh, that our medium, video games, uh, is is so um, has such a, a fantastic modding and hacking scene. So I encourage you to uh, support it, uh, support it ethically, okay? Do not go around stealing games, pirating games, uh, but please do partake. You will learn a lot about technology doing this and you'll gain a, a new appreciation uh, for the hard work that all of our modders put in. Uh, so that is, uh, that is essentially it. If you want more talks like this, uh, you can attend the IGDA Ann Arbor meetings or the other uh, meetings, IGDA Detroit, Grand Rapids uh, meet up. I believe they all do really cool talks like this. Um, otherwise, you can ask me any questions, okay, in the Discord, or you can send me an email at any time. Uh, thank you so much, team. I hope you have a, a, fa a fantastic, fantastic uh, GLGX, okay? And take care. Bye-bye.